November 2024 marks the 55th anniversary of Sesame Street. Since 1969, the show has entertained and educated multiple generations of children, teaching important lessons about shapes, colors, reading, kindness, and more over the course of its more than 4,500 episodes. Sesame Street is home to a whole crew of colorful characters that have captured imaginations across the world. Now the great pop culture debate wants to sweep the clouds away as we attempt to determine the best Sesame Street character of all time. When they sang, one of these things is not like the other, they were actually talking about me. I'm your host, Eric Resniak. Please help me welcome my panel of good neighbors for this episode. First, she only knows the numbers Count Von Count taught her. It's Ama Marfo. And it's becoming a real pro- uh, 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 problem. Well, you're always a great addition to our panel. So welcome back. Thank you. Next, like Grover, you would not want panelist Carissa Kloss to serve your meal. It's true. I am your cute, adorable, lovable pal, but a terrible waiter. But a wonderful friend and podcast panelist, and I'm so glad to have you here. I try. Thank you. (laughs) And finally, we have an unbelievably exciting special guest for this episode. Coming all the way from Sesame Street itself, please welcome Chris Thomas Hayes, the performer who brings to life Hoots the Owl and Elijah Walker. Welcome, Chris. Chris Hayes loves you. Oh. Yeah, see, I wanted to do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so excited. And up in the producer booth, we have Curtis Creekmore, who has been spending an awful lot of time lately with Bert and Ernie. If you're curious about how we ended up with this Sesame 16, become a Patreon supporter of our show or listen to the three-minute primer available wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget, you can head to this episode on greatpopculturedebate.com to find the listener bracket as well as clips of all the nominated characters so you can play along with us at home. And with that out of the way, I have in fact been told how to get to Sesame Street. So let's get on to these debates. First up, it's a unanimous victory for ultimate number one seed Grover, which meant that four seed Sherlock Hemlock, the world's greatest detective, is off the case. Egad! But Amma, you briefly wanted to give Sherlock a clue. I mean, his due. I did. I loved Sherlock Hemlock as a kid. One of my favorite Sesame Street characters growing up. And I was thinking about it a little bit before we got on today. And what I realized is the way that he attacked cases was a lot like Inspector Gadget attacked cases. And I loved Inspector Gadget. Like my mom would pick me up just a little bit late from daycare. And I was like, we're going to miss it. Let's go. And in a lot of ways, it kind of empowered kids to kind of understand like, The adults aren't always right. Like there's something really fun about watching kids understand something that an adult or someone in in power kind of doesn't. That's the fun of Mr. Noodle. It's another similar type of thing. Just having that experience. And again, this was another one of those Sesame Street things that like love Sherlock Hemlock and then years later learned about Sherlock Holmes. So this was where it started. And then I learned about the big kid version or the adult version later. Monsterpiece Theater being another one of those. So... It was a formative character for me, and I he was not going to win against Grover, but I did want to make sure that that he got a little bit of love. And you did a wonderful job, so thank you very much. Next, the majority of the panel can't take its eyes off three-seed Big Bird, but Carissa is certain that Bert, a two-seed, should advance. Carissa, tell us why you're choosing the unibrowed icon. Ama, tell us why you and Big are birds of a feather. Carissa, please go first. Well, you already stole my first argument, unibrow icon. (laughs) Um, He is one half of arguably Sesame Street's best duo, Bert and Ernie, who were my faves. Um, He also has the saddle shoes and the iconic V-neck over the turtleneck. Bert, to me, is... Uh, representative of the more serious kids, the kids who are maybe more quiet, more nerdy. He had the saddle shoes. He loved eating oatmeal. He's kind of the like kid version of a curmudgeon. Uh, he collects paper clips and bottle caps, and he's organized, and he loves pigeons, and he is non-chaotic. <laughs> he has to play the straight man to Ernie's shenanigans, and the pair doesn't work together without, you know, you need a foil. Um, So that's Bert. These are the two um, best yellow characters up against each other. (laughs) So it's a, it's a tough matchup, but I think for the quiet, serious kids, uh, Bert needs a little bit of his due, at least. For sure. Uh, he is the mellow yellow in this particular matchup. But that being said, Chris, has she swayed you or are you going to stick with Big Bird here? I'm going to stick with Big Bird. This is tough. But Big Bird's, I mean, 
he's the guy. I mean, he's the first Muppet on the show back in the 60s. You know, if I'm thinking of it sports wise, he's he's my center. He's big. I need him. I need a big guy in there. Uh, I, I have no idea what any of that meant, <laughs> but I'm assuming it's a good thing. And so, uh, so we are sticking with Big Bird. Ama, uh, are you sticking with Big Bird? I am. I, the challenge of Bert, who I love, like I was very much that serious kid who like wanted to read, and then my sister was kind of Ernie would wander in and is just like chaos nugget and i'm like not now um <laughs> but the challenge with bert is that he is so inextricably connected with ernie that to have him be the best character without his counterpart feels odd and that we've seen the bracket we know this is going to come up again but the idea of the him being part of a pair and then advancing him is difficult it reminds me so we did the best muppets uh in season three of this show ama was on it and we had statler and waldorf as separate entries and that was brutal and at one point i think they actually ended up against one another and that was awful. they did <laughs> yeah. impossible impossible <laughs> so it's actually kind of a blessing that bert is going out here because having an, a, a bert versus ernie i don't want to witness that i don't need to see these two people tearing into one another we love them both so uh we will be moving big bird into round two sadly Bert will leave the bracket. Next, the majority of the panel thinks it is easy being green and wants one seed Kermit the Frog to advance to round two, but I'm putting on my tutu and advocating for four seed Zoe. Chris, tell us why Kermit should keep moving right along, dig a dum, dig a dum, into round two, and I will give you the 101 on Zoe. Do you want to go first, Chris? Sure. Um, okay, so this is tough because I don't want to be the guy who votes against the, the the very few female Muppets we have on this thing. But I had to do it. So this is rough. Kermit, here's the thing going for him. One, he comes on there, he brings true journalism to <laughs> Sesame Street. That's I was right. like, man, there's journalism. This is great. This is what kids want to know. Another thing to realize is that Kermit was coming off of a lot of appearances. Um, the Muppet Show wasn't on yet. And Kermit was one of the Muppets that pitched um, Sesame Street to buyers in order to sell it. So if you if you Google Sesame Street pitch uh, when they're kind of going out and trying to sell the show, uh, it's Kermit the Frog and it's Ralph the Dog. Uh, and this is, I mean, he's he's got... I don't know how long this is going to get him, but uh, his the, the the fame of him, I think, kind of overshadowed Zoe. And Zoe is great. Um, and she, I feel like she's coming to her own later. And then Kermit has kind of was running things earlier. So it's a it's probably one of the best balances as far as uh, the, the, the head to head between Zoe and Kermit. Yeah, he's like the Big Bang of of the Sesame Street, right? Like we, right. we wouldn't have anything without Kermit. So I think it's a great argument. Um, let me. I want to talk a little bit about Zoe. Zoe was introduced in 1993, in part as Chris alluded to, because there were so few monsters presenting as girls, and that's something I had honestly never thought about until I was doing my research for this episode. Most of the original monsters and puppets on Sesame Street were either male presenting or gender neutral. And I'm curious for Carissa and Ama, was that something that you were cognizant of when you were when you you were growing up not really but i always really gravitated to prairie dawn she was one that i almost mentioned uh missing as well as i i just really like baby natasha <laughs> i don't know i always thought that she was so cute even though she never said anything but la, la, la. um but <laughs> yeah i i never really noticed i think because even though they were maybe gendered male, like Cookie Monster is just a kid that likes cookies. And like Grover is just like a kid who's always trying to help. You know, it, the same as like kids are sort of non-gendered in a lot of ways. You know, pre-puberty, we're all kind of the same. Anyway, <laughs> maybe not. But uh, yeah, it, it was never a sticking point or anything I noticed when I was growing up. Interesting. Ama, did you happen to have that experience or... I don't think that I noticed, but Carissa, like you, I always got really excited when Prairie Dawn was there, and I don't think that I had connected that to feeling represented as female, but yeah, there were a lot of uh, boy uh, boy Sesame Street characters, so it was always nice to see her, and I do, I do like that now there's Zoe, and there's Abby, and Rosita, and there's a lot more representation, um, even uh, like Julia, like it's it's evening itself out, and I really like that a lot. This, to me, also is of the bracket to date that we always come back to this, the generational piece of it. So sure. like depending upon who's voting, who shows up. Um, and Zoe is so much newer that if you're not watching Sesame Street fairly regularly with kids or like me, a childless adult who just likes kids TV, then 
some of these characters you might not even know. And Abby is one of those. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, this one, were you going to stick with Kermit, Ama? Oh, yes. And Chris, are you sticking with Kermit as well? Yes. Um, I will just say this briefly and on behalf of Zoe. She is going out. But uh, while she may be 31 in human years, she is in monster years forever three. And I have to give props to her rock and style. She wears the tutu. She's obsessed with dancing. She's got her pet rock named Rocco. And I don't even know if kids in the nineties got the pet rock reference, but I thought it was hilarious. So I think Zoe's wonderful. It's just a bummer. Were you going to say something, Chris? Yeah, no, just yeah, I'm, I'm amen in that. She's a fantastic character. I also like the idea uh, when you think about, I think about this more than most people, the puppeteers behind um, those Muppets. Now that uh, Fran Brill has retired, she was the one who originally did uh, Prairie Dawn and Zoe. Those characters have branched out more. So now uh, uh, Stephanie DeBruzzo is doing Prairie Dawn. Jen Barnhart is doing Zoe. So you're bringing in, it's like one person starts it and it branches off like a, a roots of a tree, which is so cool to see our puppeteer cast grow like that. Uh, not I- just the characters, but yeah. I love that. And please give us more of that type of insight. Cause yeah, that's something that had not even occurred to me. So that's great. With that being said, sadly, Zoe will be going out in round one and we are going to move Kermit into round two next three quarters of the panel. That's one, two, three, ah, 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 are counting on two seed count bond count to make it into round two. But Carissa is putting on a happy face in defense of three seed guy smiley. Chris, please tell us why math may be hard, but loving count von count is easy. Carissa, this isn't a game. Well, actually it is. But still, announce what to the panel why Guy should advance. Carissa, please go first. Guy Smiley, whenever he shows up on your screen, you know it's going to be a fun little segment. He is so enthusiastic and serious about his job, which includes hosting any manner of game shows as well as the Letter of the Day pageant, which ended with him serenading the winner always. And he, out, and he had a really nice voice. Um, he's one of the few kind of like decidedly adult puppet characters he's he has a dog named strongheart uh and there's a portrait of him in his place and he's funny um it's it's a very kind of dry humor that's probably aimed more at adults or older kids who get it but you know there's the the little segment where they're like you can call me this his is they call me guy smiley because i changed my name from bernie leader crants like <laughs> I don't know. Is a five-year-old going to find that hilarious? Because I really did. (laughs) So, you know, he's an adult and he's working, but he's like, he's so excited and he'll talk to anybody and he kind of keeps things moving along, which, you know, a lot of the uh, more childlike puppets um, just derail. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I I understand he's up against the count, but, you know, he still needed to be talked about because he was one of my favorites, even as a child. Absolutely. Now, Chris, talk to us a little bit about the count. Respect for Guy Smiley, but Mm -hmm. the count, flawless. He brought numbers. First of all, Guy Smiley, it was his job to do. The count didn't think about a job. He lived it. Numbers (laughs) numbers were his life. He couldn't even take a time off. He was like, no, I'm numbers 24-7. I love the count. (laughs) I think he goes pretty deep in in my head bracket right now. First of all, he can control thunder and lightning. Who can do that? I don't know. Is he a god? I'm not going to say that now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of hints that presume maybe he is. His car is 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 incredible. He has a the Countmobile. Uh, he lives in a castle. I don't even know where that is on the street, but it's somewhere <laughs> somewhere on the block in Queens. There's a castle that he lives in. More importantly, from an insider baseball kind of tip, I noticed that whenever I work with the count. His fashion game is insane. Mm. The the inside of his cape is just kind of just like this silk kind of like shiny material with all these like numbers like screen printed on it. And it's just like so I, I hate I don't want to use this word, but I'm going to use it. It's very pimp. <laughs> it's it's like, like, my goodness, who did this? Um, Man, what a job that would be. I would I would love to make clothes for puppets. That would be the best. Oh yeah, it's it. That's a Wrangler job in the the Muppet Workshop, man. Shout out to them for 
coming through with all those suggestions or like whenever we make a request for them they just go out and build it and like i'm gonna build it i'm gonna build the mess out of it. it's gonna be great i did, like the fact that they have a lined cape that's not just lined in silk but has numbers screen printed on it is amazing because like did the viewers ever see that no there's a there's a lot of things that people will never see that are the, these super fine details and it's all over the show on the characters themselves on the sets so I'm like, no one's going to see this ever. But that's not what's important to people who make the show. They're like, I'll see it. So they <laughs> they put that amount of uh, detail into it, which is fantastic. It's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Ama, are you sticking with the count here? You know, I am. This was a tough one for me because I was also a kid who loved Guy Smiley because I love game shows to this day, always have. Um, went into a very, very deep match game rabbit hole during mm. the pandemic, like Ugh. hours and hours of match game. So yeah. like, I love a game show host, always have. So Guy Smiley always really appealed to me. But genuinely bad at math like that part of the intro was not a lie and there was a period where i was in calculus in high school bad decision i know that now like what was i thinking um but i had this like stuffed count that would sit on my desk on test days i don't know if he helped but he made me calm down enough that i could sit through the test um so that was something that carried with me well beyond being a kid and loving him on the show i was just like i think it might help did not pass the ap exam but i did pass the ib exam so he got it half right i'll take that Excellent. So that is three for the count. He will continue into round two. Next, it's a unanimous decision in favor of one seed Cookie Monster, which means that's the way the, you know, crumbles for four seed Abby Cadabby. Does anybody want to speak on Abby? I will say Abby was not introduced until 2006. So she's one of the more modern characters. Again, it's uh, unfortunately one of our other girl characters on this list. But I like that she added the magical and the fairy elements to the show. It's just unfortunate she's up against Cookie Monster. Does anybody else have anything to say? Chris, do you have anything to say about Abby? I love Abby. Like every couple months or so, I'll get a um, a text message from Abby, mm. and it'll be the ramblings of of pure genius. <laughs> I, I will show you guys later. This is fantastic. She is great. She is magical. She's very inspirational. Man, hard seeding. That's all. That's all I can chalk it up to. I'm like, oh, it's got some some rough seeds in the beginning. The bracket is just, you know, what you gonna do? Yeah, for sure. Next, uh oh, it's an even split. Talk about tough matchups, this time between three-seed Mr. Snuffleupagus and two-seed Ernie. Amma, please tell us why you see Snuffy and want to hold space for him in this bracket. Chris, share with us why, like a rubber ducky, you're awfully fond of Ernie. Chris, please go first. Snuffy, the thing that's going against him is that he's much like Bert. He is very beholden to, um, to Big Bird. And he started off as an imaginary friend. So he really only interacted with Big Bird for a long time until um, the rest of the street discovered him. And Snuffy is fantastic. First of all, this is like picking favorite Muppets. Is, this is insane task. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're all great. When I think about Ernie, like you said, you, you think about Ernie in, as a duel with, with Bert. But he has a couple moments where he breaks away and and kind of becomes his own more so than more than Bert does. And I think about like, I don't want to live on the moon, which doesn't involve Bert at all. This is a fantastic song. Um, and I think about my song, um, put down the ducky Bert's not anywhere in that so song either. So I've seen him exist outside of Bert, uh, in a way that I have not seen Bert do. And, Kind of with Snuffy, I think Snuffy's kind of still, still even today linked to Big Bird a little bit more. That's where my head was with the decision. It is. It's really tough. And I do think we need to say, we should have said it even earlier. We love all of these characters. And I think I speak for all of my panelists and probably most of the listeners when I say we're so grateful that Sesame Workshop has been producing this show for literally generations of children. And I think it influenced so many of us. I know it did to me. Ama, with that being said, please talk to us about Snuffleupagus. So I do think that it's interesting that we've managed to get two halves of different duos going up against each other. And that makes the argument that I made earlier about Bert a really challenging one, because both of these characters are tied into that sort of an argument. My push for Snuffy here, and again, some of this might be a little bit generational, is to your point, Chris, 
Snuffy was imaginary until he wasn't. And I think that moment about him becoming visible to the entire street and the lesson that came along with that about like, listen to kids, like that was a really big deal. So I think about like the moment that Snuffy becoming visible represents and that's what pushed him over Ernie for me here. Uh, And I say this as, like I said, I grew up as a Bert and then I think something shook loose and now I am an Ernie. Um, (laughs) So much so that uh, at my old job, I had a coworker we worked very closely together. She was the one that was like super regimented. And then I would come in and be a little bit silly on that particular day. She was wearing vertical stripes. I was wearing horizontal stripes. I was like, Bert and Ernie here uh, with your update from like our department. And people are like, of course you're the Ernie. And I was like, yeah, that's me. So like Eric says, love these characters so much, but it's that moment that Snuffy gave us and gave kids in relation to adults that gave Snuffy the slight edge for me here. Excellent. Carissa, where are you on this one? I am an Ernie stan. Uh, Ernie for me. So um, I will stick with Snuffy and I will say that um, as a, a little kid who knew he was different but didn't quite know how he was different and couldn't get people feel seen by the people around him for being what he was, I really identified a lot with Snuffy. He was actually one of my core Sesame Street characters. Um, I agreed with everything that Ama said. I also agree with everything that was said about Arnie because he is the chaos nugget. And at the end of the day, I do think he's a more quintessentially important Sesame Street character. It a tie. We go to the seeds. Ernie's the two seed, Snuffy's the three, so Ernie will be moving on into round two. Next, it's a monster mash with one seed Oscar the Grouch currently set to kick his can into round two. But Carissa has intense feelings for four seed Telly Monster. I will say why Oscar is garbage, mama, and I mean that as a compliment. Carissa, tell us why Telly should teleport into round two. Carissa, please go first. This is probably the most unfair matchup because... Telly Monster is such a huge fan of Oscar. <laughs> he is a member of the Grouch Keteers, and he spends so much of his time trying to befriend Oscar the Grouch. Um, Telly, if you remember no other random trivia from this episode, uh, you should know that Telly Monster is a shortened name. His actual full first name is Television. Mm, he was, yes. <laughs> yes, Television Monster. And he was conceived as a Muppet that was a uh, obsessed with watching tv and that was his early um skits he was right up close to the television until they realized maybe this wasn't the greatest uh behavior to be modeling for children um and nicks that pretty early telly's just he's a worry wart um but he's so lovable and the things that he loves are so wonderful he loves triangles he has a little hamster named Chucky Sue. Uh, he loves stuffed animals and he has that cute little Muppet doll with him. And like Muppets with smaller Muppets is just, I mean, <laughs> come on. Um, he He's multi-instrumental. He plays the bassoon and the tuba um, as well as the triangle, obviously. And he's a monster on the spot reporter. So, you know, sometimes, you know, he goes to the scene. He can be the monster on the ground, as it were. He's up against Oscar the Grouch. So I think even he, would bow out at this argument. Chris, are you sticking with Oscar here? Yeah, I, I got to stick with Oscar. Let I love Telly. This is like more inside of baseball. Telly is he's definitely a worry wart. He's really loud. And I don't think I don't think people get that like when when Telly Monster is on set and we know he's in the scene, there are there are some people who will put in earplugs when we're puppeteering, we're like, oh, oh, Telly's like, he's very loud. It's like, it's all just like this is manic energy. And it's so fun to be around. He's, he's great. He's, he's a great guy. But Oscar is, that's hard, buddy. Oscar the Grouch is, he's, he's on it, man. He's, he's that classic character. OG. And that grumpiness, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Ama, are you sticking with Oscar? You know, I am. And it, it surprises me given the fact that if you need an anxious TV obsessive, like, that's me. <laughs> and in so many ways, Telly and I are alike. But again, if we're going with like best Sesame Street character, I think there's just so much about Oscar that feels like you. I feel like if one of them were to go, right, 
like Sesame Street would be a materially different place without Oscar, whereas Telly you would miss a little bit, but you can go long stretches without him and it doesn't have as big of an impact. So that was another thing that kind of contributed to Oscar taking the edge here. Yeah, if I look at, you know, Sesame Street characters that speak to me, television obsessed and anxious definitely is ticking some boxes. Also the tuba part of it, which I think is funny. But I mean a trash person who's a misanthrope that's just me it's it's who i am and so i have to go with oscar and oscar will continue into round two finally in round one it's one more unanimous decision this time for two seed elmo who was just tickled to advance automatically over three seed rosita does anybody want to speak on rosita chris do you want to share anything about rosita personally this is another muppet that i really love rosita is fantastic she's so nice fun to be around um this once once again like these classic characters elmo was just love and i i get that he's so popular and but but yeah rosita's rosita's great i'm trying to think of i'm bad i'm no you're good there. <laughs> i've got a couple facts so she was introduced in 1991 which i thought was interesting uh she's from mexico she's bilingual she does the spanish word of the day plays the guitar and i have to say um i think she has my favorite color of all the muppets she's a lovely lady turquoise um and i think she's just a really pretty Pretty Muppet, but she's up against Elmo, who is, you know, a Titan, right? Yeah, and I'll say this: the beautiful thing about Rosita is that when uh, Carmen Aspar, who does Rosita, they wanted to find a character for her, and so when. Rosita was created, they kind of deferred to her. She's straight up from Mexico. She came mm-hmm. over, she worked on Plaza Sesamo and came over, just kind of watch. And when she moved into the show officially, they went, what kind of character do you want? Do you want an animal? Do you want so-and-so? So I want a monster. I want this color. So everything's kind of kind of been handpicked by her. So there's a lot of authenticity around that character, which is so beautiful. That's really cool. And again, thank you so much for sharing this stuff. This is so interesting for all of us, I'm sure. That's the end of round one, folks. We're going to take a quick break to sing out loud and sing out strong. We were listening, Patty LaBelle. We'll be right back after these messages. Hey there. If you're enjoying this episode of The Great Pop Culture Debate, and I sure hope you are, we would love for you to consider supporting the show on Patreon. Patreon sponsorships start at $5 a month and include loads of great perks, including access to our super active Discord server, exclusive episodes, and warm-ups you won't hear anywhere else. And at the $10 level or higher, your own GPCD tote bag, which is only fitting as this is basically our version of an NPR pledge drive. We can only produce this show with your support, so please consider heading to patreon.com slash greatpopculturedebate and joining us today. And we are back for round two of our best Sesame Street character debate. Before we get into the Elite Eight, I want our panelists to share their social media accounts, what else they're working on, and also a cherished Sesame Street memory, if they don't mind. Ama, do you mind starting? I will start. So I am at Ama Marfo on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, on YouTube, you can find a lot of my comedy, including my half hour special called Enjoy Your Nachos. Please go watch it. We had a lot of fun making it. I will share a forthcoming Muppet adjacent activity. And then I will also share a memory. So a friend of mine earlier this summer and I decided that we are doing Muppet Girl Fall because we both have coats that give Muppety energy. She is Kermit. I'm going to be Rolf. I'm going to have a great time. I'm really excited about it. And then when it comes to Muppet related memories and Sesame Street related memories, I remember the first time I visited New York with my family, we did the tour of 30 Rock and the tour group was going into the elevators to go up somewhere or other. I don't remember. But Kevin Clash, who was still playing Elmo at the time, got in the elevators across from us, just dressed as a regular guy going up the elevator. And I turn to my mom and I go, mom, that's Elmo. And she just sighs the sigh of a woman who was like, how did I raise this person? And goes, why do you know that? (laughs) And that to me just said like so much about who I am as a person and how little of it has to do with my family because my mom is just like, of course you know that, but that can't be my fault, can it? And I was like, no, that has so little to do with you. (laughs) Love it. Amazing. And I do want to just reiterate something. What better way to celebrate the 55th anniversary of Sesame Street than by making Muppet Girl Fall a reality for everyone? So let's get into this. Let's make this happen. Thank you for that idea, Ama. Carissa, where can people find you? What else are you working on? And do you have a Muppet memory for us? 
Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Carissa Kloss. You can converse with me if you join our Patreon, um, become a supporter and see us on our Discord, which is really active all the time. And a cherished Sesame Street memory. Um, I was probably four or five when this happened. I watched Sesame Street every day. It was probably on at like three or three thirty. One day, I don't know why, but my dad took me to work with him. And so I was gone all day with him and it was really fun and it was great. And um, I remember coming home and the sun was setting and we walked in the door and I said to my mom, okay, I'm ready to watch Sesame Street. And she was like, "Uh, (laughs) that was on like two hours ago. And I was heartbroken. I was bereft. Yeah, missing it that one time uh, really (laughs) sent me into a spiral. That's how much I cared about Sesame Street. That's why you're here on this episode, and we thank you for it. Chris, thank you again for being here. Can you tell us what your socials are, what else you're working on, and if there's a Sesame Street memory you would like to share with us? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, on socials, Insta, Twitter, probably other th- other stuff, I'm uh, at – that's Chris Hayes. Hey, who is that? I think that's Chris Hayes. That's Chris um, Hayes. Yeah, so that's an easier way to remember that. Um, we're, we're, if you have children, put on Sesame Street. That's what I worked on. For the love of God, put Sesame Street on. Um, if you don't have kids or you're not into Sesame Street – uh, check out um, Eric on Netflix. Worked on that too. Mystery thriller kind of show for adults. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's really awesome. Uh, one of my biggest memories is pretty recently, 2019, I took over the character of Hoots, uh, getting ready for the um, the 50th anniversary of Sesame Street. And we did a bunch of things uh, to get ready for that. One of them was we did a jazz concert with Wynton Marsalis, Lincoln Center uh, Orchestra. It was a whole week of just jazz. I love jazz. Jazz and Muppets. And the one thing I learned is that jazz guys love Muppets. And (laughs) and Muppets love jazz. And it was just like one of my favorite memories doing all those classic Sesame Street tunes in jazz uh, form, which is so amazing. Amazing. Do you play an instrument yourself? I play saxophone, but when you're around someone like Ted Nash or the Marsalis brothers, you're like, I don't play anything. <laughs> you know? like, Do you play? I'm like, ah, I'm not no, like that. Uh, nope. G- <laughs> Comparatively? No. <laughs> like, the important question is with or without the duck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's 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 harder to play with the duck. If you put it if you put it down, it's easier. <laughs> this is great. Thank you again so much. It's such a treat for you to be here. With oh, us. thank you guys. Uh, so you can find me at Eric Resniak on Instagram or just message the at Great Pop Culture Debate account on Insta, Threads, or TikTok, or at GPCD on Mastodon. But what you really need to do right now is to sign up for our weekly newsletter, which comes out every Monday at noon, and it tells you about everything new in pop culture that week. Sign up by finding the link on this episode at greatpopculturedebate.com or via our link tree on any of our social media accounts. Now, it's time for our Patreon shout out. This one to Rebecca Spath, who has been a supporter since August 2020. Thank you, Rebecca. You're one great neighbor. If you would like to get a shout out on a future episode, become a Patreon supporter by finding the link to this episode on greatpopculturedebate.com. Now let's move into round two so we can get out and enjoy this sunny day. First up, the panel is split 50-50 between two absolute icons, one seed Grover and three seed Big Bird. Chris, tell us why Grover deserves to be the monster at the end of this debate. I will explain why even after 55 years, Big Bird is still the word. I'll go first. Of the original cast... I think that Big Bird was the biggest star of Sesame Street. And I mean that both figuratively and literally. Big Bird is eight feet, two inches tall, y'all. Big Bird has an enormous heart. And I'm sorry, if you don't experience joy when you see Big Bird, I don't know what's wrong with you. Speaking of, we have seen Big Bird a lot. He was the star of his own feature film, Follow That Bird. He has made appearances not only on The Muppet Show, but in several of The Muppet movies. He had his own massive balloon for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. During the COVID pandemic, he was also vaccinated with the COVID vaccine, earning the ire of Ted Cruz. So if you need any other reason to vote for Big Bird, please know that Ted Cruz hates him, which means you should love him more. With that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Chris, and you're going to talk to us about Grover. So when I made this decision, which is, of course, they're all big decisions. I take nothing lightly. I wanted to stress one thing. Popular is not necessarily the best. Mm -hmm. 
and yep. that's that's a run. that's how you gotta attack this 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 block because yep. Big Bird is a massive star. The thing about Grover is that he is so versatile when it comes to situations you can put him in. He can sing, he can do serious things, he can uh, he can carry comedy in a lot of different ways. One of the reasons is because he's he's smaller than Big Bird. Big Bird's so big that there's some stuff that he just can't do like Grover can do. Which I hope I'm not giving away his secret identity. Oh, but if you didn't know that oh. Super Grover is Grover, look. Mind blown. I, what? It's crazy. You this heard is, it here. So this is a tough one. I go at Grover just because the versatility of him. Um, I also got to give him props. He worked in food service industry. That's rough. Uh, they're, they're taxing tips. Um, Big Bird is, has not had that opportunity. It's uh, true. In this economy, Grover taxing the tips, my God. And he's using all that money from waitering to fund his superhero uh, thing. I, Tony Stark doesn't do that. Nope. Where where's your waiter uh, soup Avengers Tony yeah. Stark right Thank yeah you. Tony Stark who's just a waiter right? bringing soup to people <laughs> and then he's using every dollar he can to build those Iron Man suits that's 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 what Grover's doing so that's why I go with Grover and I like the idea that he um he, he sings he gets serious he he interacts with celebrities just as much as everyone does he's uh he's no slouch and he's he's pretty he's been really um consistent throughout the uh the seasons too he shows up a lot which is impressive he is also just so everybody knows the number one vote getter in this entire poll just everybody oh. knows grover was the most popular choice but that being said carissa where are you coming down is it grover or is it big bird i am not a bandwagon jumper um but grover's my guy all the way he kind of always has been and i have more to say about him assuming we'll talk about him again and uh, ama is it grover or is it going to be big bird I have Big Bird moving forward in my original bracket, but on this particular day, given what we've talked about, I'm giving it to Grover. I am. It doesn't surprise me that he's number one in the overall vote getters, especially as someone who now has a lot of like nieces and nephews at around like two to five, two to six. He's astonishingly popular. Like the number of them that's like Grover's my favorite. I never would have imagined that. Again, this feels like a little bit of a generational pick. And I know I really liked Big Bird when I was younger, but to your point, Chris, I think Grover's been a little bit more versatile. Like Big Bird, you're getting a handful of things, but there's so much that Grover can do. And again, to fund proper superheroing when you don't have the resources of a Bruce Wayne or a Tony Stark, man, that's bootstrapping that shouldn't be possible. But look at him out here doing it. So surprising myself, I am voting for Grover. All right, so we will be moving Grover into our final four. Next, the majority of the panel thinks that two-seed Count Von Count would make a wonderful addition to our final four. Ah, ah, ah. But Carissa is still flailing her arms in the hopes that one-seed Kermit the Frog can hop on by. Ama, tell us why the Count deserves to win this numbers game. Carissa, please sip some tea while you share why people with good taste prefer Kermit. But... That's really none of your business. Carissa, please go first. Yeah, when we talk about Muppet Arms, we're really talking about Kermit Arms. Kermit is iconic. Kermit the Frog, can we say that maybe he was an inspiration for Megan the Stallion? I don't know. It's possible. It's Entirely, possible. Entirely. I mean, look at the, the doors he's opened. He has held fewer jobs than Grover, but he shows up in a couple of different uh, ways. Um, he's been a newsflash reporter, and his segments are always real fun where he's interviewing uh, fairy tale characters. And then Kermit is part of kind of the emotional center of the show. He does his really sweet being green. He has like some sweet songs, some slow moments. I don't know. I just, I love Kermit. This is a really hard decision, but he's my guy. Excellent. Ama, can you talk to us about the count? This is where at any given point, I'm going to get into the pedantry of this. I'm going to be the pedantic asshole that I usually am on this show. Uh, so the title of this bracket, the title of this episode is Best Sesame Street Character. So there's a case to be made for going for best. There's a case to be made for going for Sesame Street. So this particular face-off, which... People who have listened to me before, I will always let Eric know in the comments of the bracket which decision hurts me the most. He doesn't ask. I just tell him, this was mine. Uh, trying to pick between Kermit and the Count. And ultimately, I think that while Kermit got a Sesame Street, like he was part of the pitch that it was made for, Count is Sesame Street. Kermit is a Muppet 
and is on Sesame Street. So when I think about being centrally this show, the count wins here because he hasn't really had a chance to make his mark in other ways. And the fact that he's been, again, like pretty consistently over the time that he's been on the show, had something to do, stayed towards the forefront, kept the numbers piece going. I love it. So through a combination of just character love and pedantry, I'm giving it to the count. And I feel like the count would be on board with pedantry. I feel like that's very much in his his lane. Chris, where are you on this one? I think I got to rock with the count. I mean, it, the, my, my reasoning behind this was just the fact that although Kermit was really big in the beginning, once the Muppets kind of moved away uh, and kind of like first they went to that German company, then they went to Disney eventually, you saw way less of Kermit. So he kind of disappeared. So it's kind of like after a while he became, you couldn't really rely on him as far as to use him as a character in like future seasons, thinking of all 54 seasons, 55 seasons almost as the whole, like count is across all those seasons carrying the load and Kermit kind of shows up every, you know, once a season. And then after a while, not at all. I think Kermit got out of that first bracket, but this is probably too deep for him. Yeah, I am. Um, he's much like uh, your uncle who moved away when you were a little kid and still gets you nice Christmas presents and birthday presents, but uh, he, he's not there anymore. So I'm also giving it to Count Von Count. Uh, next, three quarters of the panel wants to munch, munch, crunch, crunch with one seed Cookie Monster in the final four, but Carissa wants to keep playing in the bubble bath with two seed Ernie. Chris, your name begins with C, which stands for Cookie. Tell us why that's good enough for you to push for Cookie Monster. That's Carissa, good enough for me. It's good enough for you. Carissa, aren't you glad you have another opportunity to defend Ernie? Carissa, please go first. I love Ernie. Uh, I love Bert and Ernie, but I also, I think we mentioned earlier, Ernie has kind of more of a singular identity than Bert does. He's branched out on his own. He's got his own um, segments that he does, like put down the ducky. He's... Bert's best friend, and he's the jokester, but he's also kind of a friendship model. He, what you get through Ernie is like how you can be funny and silly, but not hurtful. And also, Ernie has been a star since episode one. He was on the show starting in 1969. We all remember the Tickle Me Elmo phase. Shortly thereafter, they branched out slightly into Tickle Me a few more guys and one of them was Ernie and I was in high school and I still got the Tickle Me Ernie for Christmas because I really really wanted it and it was very adorable and it had his little like laugh and it was just really wonderful Ernie's on my keychain <laughs> Ernie's one of my faves I gotta go with my orange guy here well talk to us about Cookie Monster Chris we haven't even talked about Cookie yet no yeah he's a gr- now Cookie Monster was around uh well before sesame back when uh when jim was doing commercials he um he used cookie monster for i was like munchos it was something like one of those like potato chip brands yeah i think it was munchos right you saw him just eating the wheels and the rah rah rah. when he moved over to sesame he kind of kept that same energy which uh which is fun the thing i like about cookie is that one he has gotten around a lot of the safeguarding that people thought was going to happen they thought that like when we got you know since sesame teaches so much um education and good health that we're going to get rid of this character who just likes to eat cookies and that did not happen he's fended that off for like almost 60 years he's evolved and we watch his evolution to even now when you watch the show he's he's got a food truck the monster foodies uh, so he's running a food truck and he's teaching kids about cooking and they're learning about where ingredients are sourced from, which is so cool. And I think he's a very strong character comedically now, too. And so that's why he gets my uh, star, of, my cookie of approval. I love it. And, you know, entrepreneurship, right? It's important to teach the children. It's like Shark Tank. That's a running theme for me in this episode. Yep. (laughs) Waiters, food truck owners. Muppets are doing it for themselves. I love it. Uh, Amma, where are you here? Is it Cookie or is it Ernie? I, too, am a champion of the working monster. (laughs) I'm going to side with Chris here. I I really like monster foodies. Like, I, I really liked that kind of evolution and the fact that they found a way to take this character that... We were talking earlier about how uh, Ted Cruz would probably hate Big Bird. Like, I love a Muppet that's going to make 
the right mad. And I feel like they're just like, well, he's just teaching them bad habits. And then they were able to evolve it into something that credibly makes sense while also still allowing him to not only enjoy cookies, but enjoy cookies with Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart while on vacation. Pretty impressive. Yeah, I think there's just something really... I don't want to like overstate it or get too highfalutin about it, but really resilient about Cookie Monster as a character. And I'm excited to honor that by having him go through. Cookie will advance into the final four. Finally, in round two, it's Red Monster versus Green Monster as two seed Elmo currently leads in the votes over OG one seed Oscar the Grouch. Ama, tell us why this is Elmo's world. We're just living in it. I love trash, so I'm going to give an awards-worthy performance in defense of Oscar. I'll go first. I felt a kinship as soon as I locked eyes on Oscar. As you might expect, given the honorific The Grouch, Oscar's defining quality is that he's constantly in a bad mood and wants to be left alone. But then when he's left alone, he's also unhappy. Relatable king! In addition to being pop culture's preeminent introvert, Oscar is also a pet lover with his beloved worm, Slimy. Fun fact, Oscar is not actually green. The first sketches were drawn in purple, and the original Oscar puppet was orange. The show's creators found that the 1970s cameras couldn't pick up the color well enough, so they scrapped it and made a whole new one in green, except the eyebrows. The eyebrows on Oscar now are the exact same eyebrows on the very first Oscar puppet. But canonically, Oscar has said that he is in fact orange. He just got all slimy from traveling in the swamp, and that explains his color. The late Carol Spinney, the original performer for Oscar, patterned his voice after a Bronx cab driver, which... Of course he did. Carol also explained that he performed Oscar as a 43-year-old specifically because it took that long for Oscar to get fully mean. As a mid-40-something-year-old myself, that is the most seen I've ever felt. With that being said, Ama, talk to us about Ama. As I think about the history of Sesame Street and how I've experienced it, I think there was a time that the show was really synonymous with Big Bird, speaking of Carol Spinney. And then I think we've evolved into an era where the show is kind of synonymous with Elmo. Like, I think the prominence that Elmo's world has taken, um, I remember the Tickle Me Elmo phase Um, Just how monumentally big that was. Rosie O'Donnell was involved. Like it was a monster, a monster Uh thing where it was just impossible to get them. And it was the popularity of that that then were like, well, what other tickle me animals can you get? Because anybody trying to make money off of something will misunderstand the lesson every time. Um, Like Elmo was the draw there, not the tickle me part. And of course, whatever market researchers were in charge were like, we choose the opposite. Anyway. In addition to the book and then later the documentary Street Gang, I believe, and Chris, you can correct me on this, there are two Sesame Street characters who have spawned documentaries of their own, Big Bird and Elmo. And when I think about the fact that like that's a really impressive thing to have happen, we've already lost one. I'm not ready to lose the other yet. I think that Elmo has just been so much of this modern version of Sesame Street that, again, best... Sesame Street character. I'm not ready to knock him out yet. Okay, excellent. Carissa, is it Elmo or is it Oscar? I think we have to go with Elmo here because of the kind of just the star power that he commands versus Oscar. Uh, Chris, is it Elmo or is it Oscar? Uh, character wise, I'm going to go with Elmo. It's still Elmo. If the- Everything, even from a puppetry standpoint, too, even not to look at that, just character. Like, Elmo is so perfect. A lot of stuff is just like the, the, the manipulation of that character is great. He's got good comedy uh, timing. Everything is so good. And you see so much of him, which is which always helps the case of just seeing a lot of a character sometimes. OK, so that's it, folks. We have our final four. We're going to take a quick break to learn the Spanish word of the day. We'll be right back after these messages. Another email newsletter? God, I know. But listen, the Great Pop Culture Debate newsletter, it's actually useful. Give us three minutes of your lunch break and we'll tell you all the coolest new stuff in pop culture that week. The biggest new movies and theaters, the hottest new albums about to drop, the TV shows everyone will be talking about. We bring it to you every ball. It's all thriller and no filler. And you'll also find out all the fun news from the podcast. Subscribe today at greatpopculturedebate.com backslash subscribe. 
And we are back with the final four of our best Sesame Street character debate. At this point in the show, I always like to take a step back and see if it shook out the way I expected it to. I also like to add at this point that no matter which option wins, we are celebrating all of these entries, and I hope nobody gets salty about what comes next. So our final four is Grover, a one seed, versus Count Von Count, a two seed. Cookie Monster, a one seed, versus Elmo, a two seed. So it's two ones, two twos. Mm -hmm. I think it's surprising that Oscar and Big Bird are not here, but at the same time, I don't know who among these four I would take out. That's just the truth of it. It's, And I think it's a testament to the amazing characters that call Sesame Street home. So let's jump right into these. I'm going to go around the horn. Grover versus Count Von Count. I'm going to start with Ama. I got to go for the Count here. I'm taking them all the way. Chris, is it the Grover or is it Count Von Count? It's Grover for me, because he's near, then he's far, then he's near, then he's far. I'm going to go with Grover. Two words, <laughs> classics. And Carissa, is it Grover or is it Count Von Count? It's Grover for me as well. So um, even if I were to vote for Count Von Count, it wouldn't matter because it would be a tie. And Grover is the higher seed. He's the ultimate number one seed. Um, I think these are both amazing characters. I think Count Von Count, it's amazing. We haven't even mentioned the fact he is canonically a vampire, right, Chris? Have we... I, they... <sighs> I I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure we've ever like brought it up. It's very interesting. Like we don't we play on all the all the kinds of uh, archetypes. The kind of the vampire, sure. like he's in the you know he's at the camp, the castle and the bats and the organ. Regardless, he's he's a fantastic character. He's got he's got some moves. Was it Susan Sarandon who we got to his castle? That's on right. a, on a yeah. date. Yeah. I was. That was the moment I was like, this guy, this guy knows what's up. The Riz like, on Cap Von Cap. Yeah, it's like, there's some Riz going on. Like, he knows what's up. It's that cape, I'm telling you. Yeah. Everybody loves a cape. But the, the, my point is, like, for five plus decades, one of childhood television's biggest stars is a vampire and no one's ever talked about it. I think that's amazing. Liberace, eat your heart out. Right. So, uh, that being said, Grover will advance into the final two. Next, it's Cookie Monster versus Elmo. I'm going to start at the back of the pack with Carissa. Yeah, this one's a little tricky for me because part of me wants to say Elmo because of sort of the ubiquitousness now, but thinking back to my childhood, Cookie Monster was always there and I didn't love the chaos cookie things as much, but he also did like the healthy food song with the vegetables. That was one of my favorite sketches. So I'm going to uh, throw a curveball at myself here and go with Cookie Monster. Ooh, Chris, is it Cookie Monster or Elmo for you? Now, I love healthy foods. Um, I believe I'm pretty positive. I talked to Chris Surf, who um, who wrote that song, and I was like, Chris, you wrote a rap? He's like, yep, that's my song. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like a black guy is impressed with a white guy's rap. That's what I'm you know? I was so, I was so, I was so in love with that man. I was like, I can't believe he wrote that song. Chris Surf is a famous uh, Muppet songwriter. Um, I'm oh, this is rough. I'm gonna go. I, I'm gonna go with Elmo. Okay, I'll do. I'll go with Elmo. All right. There's no wrong answers here. Uh, Alma, is it Elmo or is it Cookie Monster? Ah. Uh, yeah. This is what always happens, by the way, Chris, in the final four. It's literally always groans, gasps, and just general gaggery. I'm going to feel this in my yep. chest all night. Yep. That's yep. what happens. And I know Curtis hates it when I go like, this is a hard choice. I know he hates it. And Cookie Monster. Cookie Monster. Uh, is there a reason? I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. I will give my reason. I, I am Team Cookie Monster as well, and I'll tell you why. I understand that Elmo currently is like the numero uno in Sesame Street, and I get that. I have to tell you, I personally have zero connection to Elmo. I was watching this show in the late 70s to the early 80s. When Elmo became a thing with Tickle Me Elmo, I was like, who? her and I, I think Elmo was great I'm not knocking Elmo at all and I understand completely why he's beloved but w three out of these four are like original OGs and then Elmo's the outlier and I think Elmo's amazing and there's a reason he has the, the supremacy now but Cookie Monster to me is like classically Sesame Street in a way that Elmo is not and I like listen you want to talk about something that speaks to me and to my core a, a giant blue amorphous blob that just can't stuff st stop stuffing cookies in his mouth it's me it's me on that screen and so I love him I love you Cookie Monster um, so I am giving it to Cookie Monster which gives us a final two of Grover versus Cookie Monster Blue Monster on Blue Monster violence but we have to have a winner i'm gonna start with carissa where are you on this one 
I'm with Grover here. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the things that he's done, but I'd like to remind everybody who is yet to vote um, about Grover's job history. He has been an elevator operator, a plumber, a sales monster, an exercise instructor, a stagehand, a taxi driver, a mailman, a reporter, and there are so many Waiter Grover sketches. You, like, There's a YouTube playlist of them that's got like 60. He's iconic. He's the monster at the end of the book, uh, One of my, which was one of my favorites growing up. And also one year for, I don't know, Christmas, um, my daycare gave us all copies of Grover's Bad Awful Day. And man, that is an underrated masterpiece. Um, he deals with all kinds of terrible things that happen, but realizes that you know it can't be that bad and there's always a tomorrow. He's always trying to do things right, even though he rarely ever does. Uh, and I just find that so relatable. Seriously. So um, plus blue, my favorite color. He's he's repping all the right stuff. Uh, Grover all the way for me. Technically, they're both repping blue in this particular matchup, but I take your point. True, but Grover's more like royal blue blue. Got it. Ama, is it Grover or is it Cookie? I'm giving it to Grover. He is a monster of the people. He, again, that relatable thing of like, he's just trying his best. And sometimes it's not what people need, but he's just out there trying. And like, if that's not a monster for the moment we are in, like, I just don't know. And it's not to say that Cookie is not similarly relatable. And again, like in talking to kids that I know that are watching the show now, the monster popularity of Grover, like I think the show has positioned Elmo as the front runner, but I think the kids have positioned Grover. And that's something really powerful to be able to observe. So for that reason, I think especially now, you got to give it to Grover. Chris, first of all, are you surprised that it came down to this final two? Uh, only slightly, because these are really good, really strong characters. Okay. So luck of the draw. And then between Grover and Cookie, who's your pick? If I ask the question, has anybody seen my dog? <laughs> I only know one monster who will help me, and that would be Grover. I gotta go with Grover. He's he's iconic. We talked about a lot of things. Another thing that I really love about Grover is the, the global global Grover, which was a definite initiative. He's been in tons of different countries, so other countries have a version of of Grover. He does a lot of stuff. is really impressive that what they've done with that character. Um, and and just to be personal, when he's around and, and we're shooting Sesame Street, he is adorable, uh, and it's. To be said, when you're around a group of Muppets that include Elmo and everything, and you're still like, oh, Grover's really cute. <laughs> that says something. He stands, his cuteness stands out among all the Muppets. So I'm going to go with Grover. He's well, so relatable for the kids. He does like the little improv segments that he does with the children are just so delightful through the years. And you can tell that the kids for generations have loved interacting with him. I, mean, I was about to make it through examples. this episode without crying. Come on, guys. <laughs> Sorry, well, buddy. You're so close. We have, we have examples of that on this particular podcast. I'm going to make it a clean sweep, folks. I'm giving it to Grover. So yeah. there you have it. Our pick for the best Sesame Street character is Grover. Do you agree? Do you think that we need to spend more time in a place where the air is sweet? Tell us how you really feel by leaving a comment on this episode at greatpopculturedebate.com or find us on Instagram, Facebook, Threads, TikTok, or Mastodon. While you're there, make sure that you subscribe and follow the podcast so you hear about what new debates are coming soon, vote in open polls, and even decide which topics we tackle next. I want to say thank you to my panel. I always enjoy visiting on the stoop with you and give an extra special thank you to our guest, Chris Thomas Hayes. Thank you so much, Chris. This was Woo. We are so grateful for you for sharing your time and talent with us. And that goes for everyone at Sesame Workshop for making kids' lives brighter and better for literally 55 years. Clap for them right now in podcast land, everybody. Yay. And thank you for listening. If you love what you heard, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where you can get even more exclusive content and you get episodes a whole day early. We hope you have a good one. And remember, everyone is entitled to their wrong opinion. Please stop tickling me, Elmo.